In 2010, M. Night Shyamalan made The Last Airbender movie, based off of Avatar The Last Airbender, despite the show being one of the most beloved of all time. Now, check this out. The last Airbender movie was quite the opposite, as it rivaled the room in being called one of the worst movies ever made. The movie was boring, the pacing awful. We were forced under the water of the ocean. Oh, I see. It wasn't very smart. I was just upset. Thanks for saving me. Lucky. And the special effects were laughable. But one of the big mistakes the Avatar movie made was whitewashing the cast. For those of you who don't know, there are four nations in the Avatar world, water, earth, fire, and air. And each nation is somewhat loosely based on an actual group of people. I say loosely because though there's clear influence from groups of people, there's also an issue of Orientalism. For example, the Earth Kingdom is supposed to be based off of China, but the Kyoshi warriors, who are from the Earth Kingdom, seem to be based off of Japan. As much as I admire how the creators took attention to detail, such as basing each fighting style for each nation off of a real life martial art, the show still commits errors of Orientalism and some overgeneralizations of cultures. Nonetheless, even though nations can at times be ethnically androgynous, what is clear is that none of these nations are white. And because of this, it was very devastating to see how the Avatar movie sloppily casted its actors. It switched up ethnicities where it seemed out of place, and outright whitewashed much of its cast, where some of the largest outrage was around Sokka and Katara, who are from the Water Tribe, who are brown-skinned and based on the Inuit people. Despite this, they were instead played by very pale white people, and this was extremely frustrating. No one expected the movie to be as good as the show, but no one expected it to be that bad, either. Because of all this, a lot of people feel very very nervous about the Avatar Netflix show. Man, they butchered the f***ing movie remake last time, so please don't do that again. That last one was bad. That was super bad. I was so sad. I went to see it in theaters and was like, oh. So many of us are hoping that they don't mess it up like the movie did, especially when it comes to the casting. And for the most part, the casting for the Netflix show looks good. Instead of the cast being whitewashed, it's full of Asian and indigenous people. And many can't wait to see how familiar faces of beloved actors will interpret just as beloved characters. Overall, the casting looks like a win, but there's just one glaring problem, at least to some people. While the actors for Sokka, Katara, and Princess Yue are indigenous, they're lighter skinned than the original characters of the show. That situation right there just pissed me off right there because I'm like, we already had one instance of this happening. It's not like Sokka and Katara were white people or they were like very light skinned or whatnot. And they wanted to, you know, change that and be like, hey, we want these two to be dark skinned indigenous people. It's not like it was that. And that's not a problem by the way, either. But this is literally, they were always dark skinned indigenous people from the jump. And if you're gonna change that later on, it's just very much disrespectful. I think it's just Another one of those things that colorism does where it's just like, yeah, like I like seeing this person a part of my racial group there, but like they're only there because they're like six shades lighter than me. It's not enough to just say we have the right race of people. We have the right last names or whatever. Like the whole point of of inclusion, it's not just diversity, it's inclusion, right? It's to include those perspectives, stories, images for everybody that's going to be consuming the show. So for it to be such a great show and to now for a second time in the live action version, miss this, I feel like layup. That's very disappointing, but what else is new? On the flip side, you know, there is a side of people who would be like, well, you're biracial, you're multiracial, you don't count. We don't need to go that far. It doesn't need to be, they don't count. But it is, now it starts the whole conversation about colorism, phenotype, and that always ends up being more complicated because people can sometimes be so happy that we're even there that we can't even get to like, okay, yeah, we are there and we're not shaming the actors that are getting a check. But we do have to ask ourselves why the casting agencies consistently do this across all nationalities and ethnicities. This was extremely disappointing. When they cast the movie, it wasn't just a problem they casted white people. It was also a problem that they casted light-skinned people to play dark-skinned characters. Many brown people were very vocal about this, and yet our complaints went unnoticed, and a similar problem was happening again, but now in this TV show. To me, it was a slap in the face. Now, before I really dive into this video, there are some things that I want to address. First, a lot of the complaints around the colorism in the casting are from black people. And because of this, some have tried to pit black people against indigenous people. And what I have to say to that is, um, no, we are not going to do that today. I and others are not here to fight indigenous people. I think it's safe to say that we have enough 
without fighting with each other about the validity of our pain around racism. So I'm just, I'm just not here to do that today. I'm not here to invalidate uh, anyone's pain around their own racial experiences, and I'm not here to say that mine's more important. We're actually trying to talk about colorism, representation, and generally how that affects us. But doing that is not to say that our experiences of colorism are more important than indigenous people's experiences of colorism, or are more important than Asian people's experiences of colorism, especially on the topic of casting. And I hope that becomes clear as this video continues. Another issue that's come up is that people believe that we're mad at the actors for having lighter skin. I want to say that I'm not upset at any of the actors for having lighter skin. It's not wrong to be lighter skinned and it doesn't make you any less indigenous. What I and others are generally frustrated at are those who casted the show and who made the decision to erase darker skin representation that meant a lot to many of us. With that, I do think it's worth mentioning that the original creators of Avatar left the Netflix show because they couldn't control the creative direction and the casting was likely not up to them. Next, a lot of people think that the disappointment is in indigenous people being cast. However, all the comments that I've seen so far have been very happy that they cast indigenous people. I think it's very important to see indigenous representation in media, certainly for the purpose of indigenous people being able to see themselves reflected back. But I think indigenous representation is particularly important because it challenges the old and racist myth that indigenous people are a artifact of the past, rather than people who are still here, where many of them are fighting a legitimate fight against colonialism. So having indigenous people in media, even just to show that they're here and still exist, is in itself a radical act. So I'm happy they cast indigenous people. The disappointment isn't around indigenous people being cast. The disappointment is about erasing the dark skin representation of Sokka and Katara. I do want to point out that there is a separate issue that has come up around Ian Usley. hopefully I'm pronouncing his name right, the actor casted as Sokka, that I think is worth mentioning on the topic of casting. He's registered with a non-recognized Cherokee tribe and not much about his heritage is known at this point. Because of this, there's some outrage as people wonder if he's a pretendian or not, someone who pretends to be indigenous. There's a significant issue with people being pretendians and there also seems to be an issue of people trying to prove someone is a pretendian without knowing their actual heritage. So I'm refraining from having an opinion until I know more, but I wanted to mention it since it's relevant to the conversation around them casting indigenous people. And if any indigenous people want to comment on this, I want to invite you to share your thoughts in the comment section. For now, I'd like to say that as far as we know, I'm glad that indigenous people are cast for the roles of the water tribe and that my issue is really that the darker skin representation of Sokka, Katara, and Princess Yue was erased. With all that being said, I want to point out that there's no conflict in casting indigenous people with darker skin to play the roles of Sokka and Katara and they could have just casted darker skinned indigenous people. It's weird because when I bring this up, it seems that some people believe that darker skinned indigenous people don't exist and that I'm trying to take away representation from indigenous people. But darker skinned indigenous people absolutely exist and they could have cast them, but they didn't. I think what would have been cooler is to not only cast indigenous people from anywhere, but to specifically cast Inuit people, since those are the people that the water tribe is based off of. And to be clear, if they're simply not darker skinned Inuit people, I think in this situation, it's much more important to simply cast Inuit people for these roles of the water tribe. But based on these pictures of Inuit people, it seems that there are darker skinned Inuit people. So it seems that they could have cast Inuit people with darker skin, but instead they did neither. So I found the casting of those characters very frustrating. And I'm not alone. A number of darker skinned people felt a similar way. And to be clear, when I say darker skinned people, I truly mean darker skinned people. Sokka Katara and the rest of the brown characters in Avatar meant a lot to brown skinned people of many different races. And so while I'm going over this as a black person and while the people talking in this video are black, I want to acknowledge that other darker skinned people are also affected by this choice in casting. So when I and others commented on this choice to find lighter skinned actors to play darker skinned characters, I was surprised to see how hostile and dismissive some people were. One person said, the people getting mad at the Katara casting because she isn't dark enough can suck my nut. Nothing will ever be enough for these people. This person says that I'm incoherent, absurd, and have no sound reason. And when I talked about colorism, one comment said about me, she's a bigot, nothing deeper than that. I genuinely didn't think it would all be that controversial to talk about this, at least not to the kind of crowd agrees representation matters. But even though there were people who understood where I and others were coming from, I was surprised at some people's reactions. The person who said that I was absurd photoshopped an image of the actor playing Katara, saying that she's dark enough. However, there are numerous pictures and even footage from previous movies and TV shows of all these actors. It's clear that all of them are much lighter skinned than the original Sokka, Katara, and Princess Yue. Ultimately, I'm not really interested in nitpicking if these actors' skin tones are close enough. This does feel really gross to me. It, it just starts to feel dehumanizing to the actors themselves, and I feel really gross about it. 
At the end of the day, I and others noticed the decision to find lighter skinned actors to play darker skinned characters. And a lot of us just felt disappointed to lose that kind of representation. This whole situation reminds me a little bit of when Bee and Puppy Cat came out, a show made by Cartoon Hangover, a subdivision of Frederator, the studio that made Adventure Time. When Bee and Puppy Cat came out, it was amazing. It was endearing. It was excitingly different from Adventure Time while also seeming like it was going to be on par. They released a few episodes, but then had a reboot on Netflix. And in this new version, they changed the art style where at times it was clear that Bee was drawn thinner. She was still a heavier character, but there were moments where they slimmed her down. Now, I myself didn't actually notice the change in weight until someone pointed it out to me, but there were a number of people who did. One person said, it's so sad. When I saw the original YouTube shorts, the ones after the pilot, Bee's design made me so happy. It was the first time I'd ever seen a cartoon heroine who looked like me, and it was one of the many things that made me fall in love with the show. The fact that they slimmed her down for Netflix makes me so upset. It really shows what Netflix thinks about plus-size representation. They only greenlight shows they think will make a lot of money, and they think viewers don't want to watch a show with a plus-size female lead. The constant message is that thinner people are better. This is a painful message to hear and that pain is legitimate. And so even though I and others might not have noticed that B was drawn thinner, that doesn't mean that people are wrong for noticing that and feeling hurt. In fact, it's not really a question about being wrong. This is really about how people feel and being able to express that. And I find this to be a similar situation with the Avatar The Last Airbender Netflix show. Just as fat people are constantly being told that to be thinner is to be better, dark-skinned people are constantly being told that to be lighter is to be better. When I was growing up, being darker skin was a very much like a not good thing. It was like, you got, you got bullied for it in like my all white space at least in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. You got bullied for being darker skin. Whereas like um, the mixed kids were more so popular just based on appearance, you know? And I had to conflate my personality to like conflict with that. So, so to, see, to see only lighter skinned people is like kind of like a slap in the face where it's like, okay, we like representation, but you're still, you're still adhering to the same normalities, you know? A lot of dark-skinned people have trauma around hearing their whole entire lives that to be lighter is to be better. This issue is called colorism, and Hollywood has a long history of perpetuating it. Especially for, for Black women and Black girls, Netflix notoriously refuses to cast any darker-skinned women or young girls especially in their shows featuring black uh black people hollywood has a big issue when it comes to like the subject of colorism like this is why it's disappointing but it's not surprising that a lot of the people that we see like you know in the cartoons or whatnot when they actually are portrayed in live action like or even in the comic or whatnot we see them and they were like oh that that person they may be black but that's not like the accurate skin tone. I'm very much um, big on like, you know, skin tone accuracy. I think that if a dark skin cartoon character, they need to be played by a dark skin actor. It matters because when you talk about the history of assimilation and colonialism, it matters what features that we allow to be at the forefront. If we watch the show and it comes out and you have lighter skin actors as the leads, and then all of a sudden they could find all these brown people for the background cast, what does that say about who we think should be the faces of our communities? I don't want to demean anyone else that is like lighter skinned and a part of these groups because like that is also a unique experience. But like in media, like lighter skinned people are so much catered to and given like better traits a lot of the time I feel. Like when I watch movies, when I watch shows and everything and darker, darker, skin darker skinned people are given like the worst traits. like. Well, the more bottom of the barrel traits and they're like um, reserved to the villains. It's just like I said, they want it like, OK, let's actually do this accurately. But, you know, let's do it so it can still appeal to the white gaze because it's always the white gaze. It's always what it comes down to. Everything is rooted in white supremacy at the end of the day, sadly. It reminded me of how I felt um, with America Chavez's casting of like, I love this talented actress. They are, you know, Mexican. I'm glad that they're getting a bag, but like America Chavez is darker skinned, you know, she, you know, openly gay, curly hair, and that was just not there. And so it's like the material is there. The, the thing that you're adapting was darker and you made it lighter. And that's always going to be an issue in my mind. Um, and there's no getting around that because if you can draw them dark, you can cast them dark. 
And this is why so many of us find it frustrating when Hollywood continues to lighten the skin of its actors. Again, this is not to say that the actors are bad or even less indigenous for being lighter than the characters that they were cast to play as. This is not even to say that black and dark skinned people are the most important voices in the room when talking about the casting of Avatar. What I am trying to say is that many of us feel hurt when characters that we love are lightened because of how common of an issue it is that lighter skin is better. And expressing that pain and hurt is important. It's important in addressing the issues of colorism and it's important just for the sake of being heard. Because of all this, it was such a slap in the face to try to talk about this and be met with so much hostility. And again, not from people who think that racial issues are silly, unimportant, and non-existent, but from people who likely agree that representation matters, yet found us to be out of control when we talked about common issues such as colorism. And I really want to spend the rest of this video unpacking this more. This comment says, Calling Kiyawenti a white passing and she didn't deserve the role because she's not dark enough, even comparing her skin tone to a f***ing paper bag. We're not all dark skinned. It is so damn demeaning to see people say she doesn't deserve to play the role because of her skin tone. It honestly feels like racism. So let's unpack this. I think I can understand where this person is coming from, especially if they themselves pass as white. A lot of people who pass as white talk about how people will erase their experience as a person of color because they aren't dark enough. And I can see why that would be really frustrating. I'm half Chinese and that part of my identity is constantly erased. Also at the same time, there are a number of black people who think I'm not black enough because I'm half Chinese. So most people don't even know that I'm Chinese to begin with. And then when it comes to being black, there are those who say I'm not black enough on account of being half Chinese or also because I'm adopted. So while I don't know what it's like to be white passing and have your racial identity erased in that way, I can relate to how frustrating it is to have your racial identity erased by people who literally have no authority or place to decide that for you. So it's very frustrating when people erase your racial identity. And I think that this person believes that this is what's happening to Kiyo Endio when they call her white passing. It sounds like these people are saying that since she's not dark enough, she's not indigenous enough. So first, I don't think that Kiwan Dio is white passing. Even though she has lighter skin, it's hard for me to think of mistaking her as being white. I'm genuinely not sure if this person is saying that Kiwan Dio is white passing because they actually think that or if they're just being rude. Given how there are so many white people who can pass as non-white, the idea of white passing is certainly changing. But I think regardless of if Kiwan Dio is white passing or not, to you, I don't think this person is saying that Kiwan Dio isn't indigenous enough. Rather, I think that this person is upset that they got someone whose skin is as light as some white people's skin tone when they're playing a darker skinned character. Another reason why I think this is because this person brought up a paper bag. When that happened, I think it's very unlikely that this person was comparing Kiyo Wendio's skin color to a random piece of trash. What I have no doubt in my mind that this person was referring to was the paper bag test. Back in the day, light skinned black people would prevent darker skinned black people from having access to resources and public spaces if they weren't light skinned enough. And the litmus test for this was a paper bag. That's why it's literally called the paper bag test. If your skin was darker than a paper bag, then you were prevented by other black people from having access to certain resources and spaces. And forms of this colorism still exist in our society today. So this person isn't comparing the actor's skin to some trash. They're saying that this person's skin is even lighter than this standard for light skin when they're cast to play a darker skinned character. So while I do agree that it's a problem when people erase racial identities, I don't quite believe that that's what's happening here. I think there are two different conversations happening. One is where a person is complaining about the colorism and casting. Another where someone is saying that having lighter skin doesn't erase your indigenous identity. Both of these sentiments are valid, and in my opinion, important to express. But what I did ultimately find hurtful, whether there was a misunderstanding or not, was framing the discussion of colorism as the racism itself. I don't think that people understand how much colorism affects a number of black people, and why it strikes such a chord when once again, characters we love are lightened. For example, studies have shown that even at a young age, people are biased against darker skinned people. Show me the bad child. Why is she the bad child? Because she's a lot darker. Show me the ugly child. Why is she the ugly child? Because she's like, um, a lot darker. Show me the child who has the skin color most adults like. And show me the child who has the skin color most adults don't like. Show me the dumb child. Okay, why is she the dumb child? Because she has black skin. Why is she the bad child? Because she makes fun of everybody else's skin color. Show me the dumb child. About 76% of the younger white children pointed to the two darkest skin tones. Show me the mean child. About 66% of the younger white children pointed to the two darkest skin tones. Show me the child who has the skin color most children don't like. 
Again, about 66% of the younger white children pointed to the two darkest skin tones. TV shows will often show the darker skinned friend as being difficult, rude, and sassy compared to their fairer, kinder, and more reasonable counterparts. Hey guys, this makeover thing isn't working. You got that right, because the next thing you're gonna have made over is you may quit dripping. Shut it up! You are such a big baby. Would you get off the breast already? Your bottles are in the fridge. Gina, let's go. And in general, many darker skinned people are made to feel lesser simply for having darker skin, which is even more apparent when we listen to Lupita Nyong'o read an excerpt from her book, Sulwe, where she reads a prayer she had said as a child. Dear Lord, why do I look like midnight when my mother looks like dawn? Please make me as fair as the parents I'm from. I want to be beautiful, not just to pretend. Mm. I want to have daylight. I want to have friends. If you hear me, my lord, and would like to comply, may I wake up as bright as the sun in the sky. Amen. All of these social pressures have led to a number of darker skinned people bleaching their skin. Nothing worse. Everything has the same reaction. Is is my skin will flare? I would red rash everywhere, you know, and I'm tearing up because y'all don't understand what I go through, you know? It's me inside what I'm dealing with. Nobody knows that. So everybody just looking on the stage like, oh, y'all shouldn't bleach, y'all shouldn't bleach. You don't know what a person goes through, the reason they didn't get to this point that they want to bleach. People don't know what dark skinned people go through to try to find love and acceptance. I was made fun of my whole life for just having brown skin. I am not a dark skinned person, but I was made fun of my entire life because I my skin is brown. And so when I see what dark skinned women go through, just knowing what I went through as a black and brown person, whatever they have gone through has been that much worse. And I can't imagine because what I have gone through as a black woman is horrible. So when I watch this clip, it's like people don't know People don't know what people are put through because of how we see their skin tone. They don't. I, I think people need to learn about this and, and, and understand this. At the same time, while there's light skin to privilege, I also want to know that there's issues that come with having light skin. Many people see light skin as emasculating to black men. And of course, there is how some black people will see those with light skin as not being black enough. I've just been bombarded with people telling me that I wasn't black and, you know, as a compliment. And I went to my dad and I was like, dad, am I not black enough? And I just remember he started to cry and he was um, so emotional. And he just told me, you know, you are black enough. You are all the black that you need to be. You are beautiful. You are smart. You are caring and charismatic. And don't let anyone tell you any different. Colorism is a facet of white supremacy and absolutely white people enable and reproduce colorism. But we need to have a long talk about how we as black people are also doing this to ourselves. We are putting down dark skinned people while oftentimes treating light skinned people as not being black enough. This is damage that we're doing to ourselves and we need to stop it. While black people have our own issues around colorism, a number of other races have their own unique struggles around colorism too, which has made skin bleaching a worldwide phenomena. Now it's a you know, multi-billion dollar business. In other parts of the world, you will find things that are called skin so white, white perfect, white and lovely. And they're popular throughout many African countries, the Caribbean, Latin America, the Middle East, India, Philippines, Japan, uh, broadly. Many Asian countries have the beauty standard of pale white skin. Parents start speaking negative stuff about the baby's skin color. So just imagine how the child grows up. When I was younger, they would always call me pretty but, pretty but dark. Whatever that fair girl embodies in my head is just someone that's a little better than me. Colorism deeply affects how many brown skinned people see ourselves and how other people see us. Based on these clips, it's clear that colorism looks different from culture to culture, but the common thread is that people of lighter skin tones are often favored. And because of this, even when people cast the right race, it's still an issue when Hollywood chooses to lighten the skin of its actors, because this constantly reinforces the message that to be lighter is to be better. Now, some people might understand why colorism is a problem, but still not might understand why are there black people who are upset about Sokka and Katara being casted as lighter skinned when Sokka and Katara aren't even black. I think people don't realize how so many black people identify with Sokka and Katara. I love Katara. Like no one will ever make me hate her. 
Like, no. Because her, uh, even though she wasn't black, she was still, like, of darker skin. So that made me, that's part of the reason why I was, like, more, you know, catered towards her because, you know, I like to go towards characters that look a lot like me. One thing about Katara is that, like, even though she was strong, we were, she, she was human. We allowed, we were allowed to see her cry. She made mistakes. She wasn't perfect. Like, and people keep forgetting that Katara was only, like, 14, too. She was a carer. Like, she cared for people. She was there for people. She was, like, on a journey as everyone else. And that's why I enjoyed her so much. But like Katara, like she was so special to me then as a kid because I thought she was like a positive role model for me. We had this darker skinned girl that was a leader. We got to see her break down. This and then the third. I was like, this is the perfect kind of character that I would love to see more of. And we don't really have any other character out here that's like Katara, that being like an indigenous girl that's like that. We know that we are not the same race. And yet, because we have similar skin tones, a lot of us still end up identifying with them. We are so underrepresented that we'll start looking in any place to see ourselves. And I think the example that Turb brings up paints this perfectly. Dragon Ball Z, I always thought the Namekians were black. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Just because watching it um, as a kid, Piccolo was like the cool black character to me. And like Dende and how he like reacted to like the grandfathers and villagers around him was very like Sudanese to me. So like I thought I thought those were like black characters, you know, like me and my cousins did. I have not met a single black person who has watched Dragon Ball Z and doesn't see Piccolo as black. And as we have all quietly believed, there is a notion that persists in the back of our minds that Piccolo is the black guy of Dragon Ball. Is Piccolo Black. So a lot of you may have thought about this already. I just wanted to make my own case because I think he truly is Black. I don't know if people held a meeting to decide this green man is Black or if literally individual people independently came to this conclusion. But yeah, to Black people, Piccolo's Black. I've never watched Dragon Ball Z. I do find this endearing that black people did this, but I think it also really goes to show how because there's so little representation, people will constantly look for something, anything that is similar or close enough. Any real positive forms of representation for you outside of stereotypes, you're gonna deviate. You're gonna look through at things which might not be like specifically black, but more on the black side, like those are brown characters. You know, you're going to look at people like that and you're going to imprint on them and you're going to be like, oh, well, that's a representation of me. Because when there's no representation at all, like you can really only imprint on the small speckles of representation you can see. I don't know. There's just always just like little nuggets that you have to like grasp at when it comes to like shit like that. You have to be like, oh, like this person like also like has bundles that like my mom would wear or like, you know. I could possibly grow my hair out and make it look like soccer if I wanted to, you know? Especially growing up, you kind of have to, like, take bits and pieces and kind of form your own kind of, like, not headcanon, but just kind of, like, cater your own, ex your viewing experience by, like, seeing, like, different aspects of yourself in there. I think once it starts getting into, like, you, like, erasing the actual identity of the character, it can be one thing. But like I said, me, like, seeing myself and somebody else doesn't erase who they are, if that makes sense. And so even though we're not the same race as Sokka and Katara, it was really enough for a lot of us in this instance to see people who looked like us. I watch Avatar with like my little sister. So if I saw like darker skinned people in the movie, like th those moments of like seeing dark skinned people in media, when you're watching it with your family, nothing flutters your heart more. I just um, enjoyed seeing like characters that reminded me of my myself and like my siblings and like my cousins and like little kids I went to school with because you know then we would talk about it like at school and when it came down to like all right like it's recess and it's time to play and stuff I didn't have any issue being Sokka even though he didn't have any airbending skills or or any building bending skills for that matter because uh Sokka was that dude and like you know fell in love with the girl who turned into the moon and like I don't know. That wasn't as relatable, but like it was relatable <laughs> at the same time, you know, like. I still at the time knew that it was really important to see a darker skinned character be seen as a romantic lead and powerful and attainable. All the things that we don't usually get to see a character like that be. Part of the reason why so many people liked um, 
Avatar The Last Airbender is because they did have darker skinned characters in the series. Like, that's the reason why so many girls liked Katara. Like, brown skinned girls and dark skinned girls liked Katara. That's part of the reason why I liked her, because her skin tone was similar to mine. That's why so many, like, even though I'm not, I'm not indigenous, but I am a, I am a woman of color, a woman of color that is brown skinned. It was nice to see that on, you know, on the screen, especially Nickelodeon, because Nickelodeon has a very racist color history, okay? It was great to see that. It bothered me so much when I saw her casting that she wasn't going to be portrayed accurately to the way she looked, because I was like, no, please, like, this is one of the few characters that we have that's like this. Please don't take that away from us. Sokka Katara and the rest of the Water Tribe meant so much to me and so many other brown and black people. There are those who think that black and brown people should shut up when it comes to the colorism in the casting. Well, I think there are other important voices and perspectives on the topic of colorism and casting. I do think that how black and brown skinned people are affected by colorism and dark skin representation is very relevant to this conversation. So now that we've talked a bit about colorism and how the representation of Sokka and Katara meant so much to others, I want to talk a little bit about what that representation means to me. The other day I remember watching a video where a black adoptee talked about when looking in the mirror, this person will sometimes be surprised to see a black face staring back. Now it might sound like this person is in denial around being black, but this person says that's not what's happening and that this instead happens because of being adopted and raised by white people. So though this person understands being black, sometimes there's a surprise when looking in the mirror and seeing a black face staring back. Now, when I heard this story, I was shocked. Not because this sounded weird, but because sometimes I do this too. And I didn't know other people had this experience. In fact, had I not heard that someone else had this experience, I would have never said this out loud. I don't think people would get it. People might think that I'm anti-black, which I'm sure there will still be people who think that. But for me, I don't really know how to explain that I don't think that's what's going on for me. I think for me, it has more to do with trauma than being anti-black. When I was a kid, I was often one of the only black people around, let alone one of the only people of color. And even though the white kids around me knew very few black people and had only been exposed to white society, they as white people would often tell me, a black person, what it means to be black. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say, some of you white people have some fucking cacacity, you know? <laughs> Okay. They would tell me that black people are dumb and poor. People assumed I was from the ghetto and these things aren't a sign of you being bad. It just showed how people assumed these things about black people and would use those things to look down on us. Some wondered if I was affiliated with gangs. Many people comment on how to them, black people are angry and mean. Many people expressed to me how ugly they thought black people were. It was also very common for my hair to be made fun of, which is why it often is done in this pristine way when on video, even though white people still have issues with my hair. You know, just be yourself because white people will find a way to shit on you anyways. None of these people were malicious. To them, it was simply a matter of fact that being black was something to be bad or unwanted. I actually remember later on in life having a friend who was Indian and we both had the same color of skin. And this was really exciting to me because we could share makeup, which we rarely if ever got to do with our friends. And we ran out to show her mom, look, we're the same color of skin. And her mom laughed and said, no, no, you're not the same color of skin. And I still don't really understand what that interaction meant. Why did she laugh? Why did she insist that we had different skin colors when they were indistinguishable? And when I think about it, I think that maybe to her, there was perhaps something funny about the idea of having the same skin color as a black person. So constantly having all these negative experiences around my skin inevitably created a split in my psyche. I was told that being black meant something bad, very bad, but I didn't think of myself as bad. I just thought of myself as me. And so when I looked in the mirror and saw a black person, it didn't make sense to me. I didn't have a family to talk me through this and explain that this is what racism is. For a long time, the only other black friend I had to confide in was another person who was also adopted. And so as kids, we were both left to grasp these extremely complicated and painful topics on our own without any direction. And when it came to media representation, there wasn't much comfort there either. There were some sitcoms that had truly touching moments, like Will dealing with the abandonment of his father. How come he don't want me, man? But in general, most episodes lacked the emotional depth I craved to overall feel represented. And then Avatar Last Airbender came out and that changed everything for me.
It was the first time that I can remember where there were people who had skin that looked like mine that I really wanted to be like. While other cartoons had shallow character development contained to one episode, Avatar went hard with full character arcs. We got Sokka who comes off as the comic relief, but there's actually a lot more to him as he finds his purpose in the group when he doesn't have any bending powers. He also works through missing his dad who's fighting in the war. We have Katara who is a healer and a fighter, and we get to explore who she is through both of these facets. She's a bit naggy at times, but this is mostly due to having to grow up too fast as she lost her mother to the Fire Nation. And throughout her journey, she deals with the notion of revenge and healing as she seeks closure around her mom being killed. These are brown skinned characters who got to be fully developed human beings in a way that I had never seen before. It was the first time that as someone with my skin color, I was finally seeing myself. My whole life I was told that my brown skin was a sign of being ugly, of being dumb, of being mean. But for Katara, her brown skin didn't mean any of those things. Her skin didn't mark her as an oppressed person. It didn't make her ugly. It didn't mean she was stupid. It was simply another facet of who she was, all while getting to be a fully developed human being. And I needed to see that. I needed to see a brown person written with that much depth and humanity reflected back at me because I didn't grow up with that in my life. And I didn't get to really see that on TV until I saw Avatar The Last Airbender. Another character that meant a lot to me is Princess Yue. When I was a kid, I was told the very common saying that I can't pretend to be a princess because I'm black. And to be clear, it's not that I want to think of myself as a princess. I'm not a fan of monarchies, but as a kid, I'm not thinking about that. I'm thinking about how princesses embody the idea of being good, kind, and beautiful. And I'm thinking about how I'm told that because of the color of my skin, I can't be any of these things. In fact, not only can't I be these things, I'm told that I'm the opposite of these things, that I'm bad, mean, and ugly. And yet, here was Princess Yue, who though wasn't black, had the same or similar skin color as me, and was somehow effortlessly embodying the idea of being good, kind, and beautiful. In general, it was a breath of fresh air to see a darker skinned person associated with the moon. Like many people, I associated the moon with a sense of longing. Yet a lot of people assume that darker skinned people are uninterested or even incapable of these kinds of emotions. So for me, it was a breath of fresh air to see a darker skinned person embody these kinds of feelings that are generally not associated with people like us. These characters aren't black, but they helped me feel comfortable in my own skin. In Avatar, there were so many characters who were brown, and they just gotta be people in a way that I didn't know that I was allowed to be. As a kid, this showed me that my brown skin doesn't mean that I'm a bad person, brown skin doesn't mean I'm ugly, and brown skin doesn't mean that I can't feel the full range of human emotions. And even as I'm still working on loving the color of my skin, this show still tells me all that. And that experience of self-exploration is so important to me and others, which is exactly why it felt so ridiculous to essentially be told, shut up. This instance of colorism doesn't have anything to do with you and other black people, when clearly it does. And this is really what I want to focus on in this video. It is not a problem that there are black people who are upset about the colorism in casting for this Netflix show. Now, of course, if people are saying something that's colorist or invalidating racial identities, that's a problem. But what's not a problem is that a number of black and darker skinned people feel hurt by yet another instance of colorism. And to be clear, I'm not trying to make this video to convince anyone of that. A number of people have made up their minds and I'm not going to engage with those people. For me, what I would really like to express in this video is how this experience made me feel. I constantly see leftists who know little to nothing about the racial discussions that black people have try to step in and be the voice of reason. And of course it's jarring to have people understand and so little try to be an authority. But it's not just that, it's the experience of having people say that they want to be allies to black people. And then as soon as something doesn't quite make sense to them, whether it be because they don't read books written by black people or because they're not in community with us, if I or other black people say something, that just doesn't quite make sense or is unfamiliar, I'll notice that people will often feel a sudden unease, where me or other black people are then perceived as unhinged and people who need to be controlled. Now, this is nothing new to my life. Growing up and even now, it's really that talking about how I feel and my racial experiences is very threatening to a number of people. And while I generally do expect this kind of reaction, particularly from non-black people, it's still very jarring to see this dynamic when people say that they're allies, but at any given moment, see you as a threat. 
This caused me to speak very carefully, but no matter how carefully I speak, this is still going to happen. I've been working on trying to let this go because when people have made up their minds about you, they're not interested in understanding more and it's generally just best to move on. But still, this experience throughout my life has been psychologically damaging. It's part of the reason why I have the word flowers in Professor Flowers. Sure, I like flowers because I think they're pretty, but I also wear them a lot in hopes that I can express a side of me that people find beautiful rather than threatening. This is a part of myself that I genuinely like to express, but I do feel more pressure to present myself in these ways because of these dynamics. And I can't speak to how being seen as a threat makes other black people feel, but I definitely do see black people get attacked in this way quite often, especially in online leftist spaces. When people do hear of the racial discussions many of us are having, it's very common for people to develop an anxiety around black people and try to control what we say. So bringing this back to Avatar, I just couldn't believe that this was now happening as some of us were complaining about colorism. I know this may seem small, but to me, I just couldn't believe that even this, even this is something that people want to police us on. Even this, even this. I can't just talk about how it hurt me as a black and brown skinned person to see characters who helped me feel good about the color of my skin be lightened. These aren't the people who complained about the Little Mermaid being black and who think all these racial discussions don't matter. No, these are the same people who call themselves allies, that representation matters, yet in all seriousness, with their whole chest, to believe that we need to be policed about the colorism in this show. I know it seems like a small thing and to a lot of people, it's just another day. But for me, that's what did it. I haven't made a video in seven months. This experience kicked my anxiety and depression to the side and replaced it with the anger that drove me to make this video. And here we are talking about Avatar and colorism. So yes, the brown skin characters in Avatar meant a lot to many brown skin people. And the choice of colorism is no doubt a hurtful experience for a number of us. But these aren't the only topics that I wanted to discuss. Before we end this video, I want to talk about one more thing when it comes to representation. While the representation of Sokka and Guitar meant so much to me and other brown skin people, I know it's not everything. I think it's great that I and others relate to characters of a different race. I think this is very humanizing to each other, so I think it's actually very important to be able to do. But I also understand that the other half is being able to tell our own stories. It's cool to see people uh that are dark, darker folks and people my complexion and darker you know what i mean people with dark skin it's cool to see that right but i think for me one of the biggest things really is about telling our stories when they put like black characters in historically white roles i'm just like i don't care like i don't get this, like i'm not gonna go see that because you did that i don't i don't care right what means more to me is when i see something that i can really relate to not like me trying to be a, a, a not seeing just myself reflected in like image but also in continence and character and, and feeling. And when I feel it, see that reflection in like all ways, right? And I don't even think you can create that if the director and writer and all that's white. I don't think it can happen because I don't think that they're going to understand what they need to do to make it happen because they don't have those experiences themselves. There's so many stories to tell. There's like, you know, there's middle class stories, there's there poor stories, there's poor rural stories there's all these different stories there's stories straight out of africa stories you know what i mean there's stories from haiti stories there's like there's all these stories that we can tell that have diverse amounts of like wisdom knowledge as well as just like make us feel home and i think that's why it's important as a whole for everybody so we can have that literally um <laughs> i just want to say it's gonna be funny so we can taste the rainbow you feel me so we can taste the difference between all, all the different perspectives and all different people that actually live on this planet instead of it being like you know secondary instead of it being like a position where you know we're secondary cast in a story that isn't about us, you know what I mean? It's really important to be able to see yourself in art, not only for the sake of humanizing yourself to others, but it's also an important part of self-actualization and self-exploration. Your experience is valid, you know? And once you see other people that have also justified your experience, like it makes you more enthusiastic to take that journey. And with every single step you take, you just become a more comfortable and more like happier person with yourself i feel i don't know if you've ever you watch netflix shows but uh kim's convenience and it was about this korean american uh family that owned this like convenience store in toronto and i related to it so much there was it was canadian and they were in toronto but there was no, almost no white people it was it was mostly like just uh koreans and like uh jamaicans apparently fun fact those stories really mapped on very well to my story as a nigerian american uh family and that's what i want to see more of that type of representation i don't know for me i get frustrated a little bit because i feel like that's how simple 
it is like it's all we're asking um and then we're like having these long discussions as if like we're solving um newtonian physics again on the level of what it does to the identity of a people who have having their identity stolen it matters who gets to to show us and highlight us on an international stage and that is what american media is is an international stage that has so often put any version of blackness it wanted and now it's our time black brown indigenous asian for us to reclaim that space back and tell the stories that we want to tell and highlight the people that we feel have been unseen and that's why it matters not just for like the tumblr gifts which are great but for reclaiming voices and images and and forming a new identity of ourselves in this world. Ultimately, I hope everyone gets the chance to tell their own story so we can explore and understand ourselves, so we don't have to hold our trauma on our own, and so we can feel a sense of community and know each other. This is the ultimate goal. But even if this is the end goal, for me, it still meant a lot to see the brown characters in Avatar help me love the color of my skin. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching. If you're black or a person of color and would like to support me, please consider subscribing to my channel. And especially if you're a queer black person or a person of color, subscribing would mean a lot as well. I would like to move my channel and social media platforms out of the spaces I've described in this video and into spaces where queer, black, and non-white people can hopefully have healthier conversations. If you haven't already, check out the channels of the people who are interviewed in this video, which are linked in the description below. A special thank you to all my patrons. If you'd like to donate, we have a book club where we read leftist work. And thank you all for watching.